I'm Christina. I'm one of the, one of the program managers at Healthy New Albany, and I'm so excited to welcome you guys tonight. Thanks for joining on. Um, I always gain a wealth of knowledge every time I talk to Molly, even if it's just popping by my office for like two minutes, so I know it'll be great. Um, I just wanted to share a couple of functional things. We try and do these um, ask the experts once a month or so. So, and they, sometimes they're virtual, sometimes they're in person distance, we kind of change. So just uh, as you're looking forward in the future in April, oh, we're talking so about stress, so which I'm sure none of us can um, relate to, but tools to cope with stress. And then in June, we're talking about sleep and the impact of sleep in our lives and how we can have healthier right. sleep. So if you wanna check those out as we move on in life. And for tonight, just, um, I'll probably put most, or if you want to put yourselves on mute or I'll mute you, um, Molly is going to kind of go through some slides. If you do have questions during, please feel free to just use the chat box. And then um, I'll either Molly will see it or I'll try and interrupt and kind of point out the questions. Um, we'll also have time for questions at the end, but if there's something that's very specific on the topic that we're talking about right now, please feel free to, to interject with that. Um, so that we can address whatever the question is. And that's all I have to say. So I'm gonna go ahead and let Molly take it away. All right. So I'm gonna to start to share my screen and this is always a little bit of a, uh, hopefully this works. Okay, can everybody see that? Okay, great. Um, so thank you very much, Healthy New Albany, Christina. Um, my name is Molly Linick, and I think I know many of you, but I am a registered dietitian and my master's is in public health and I've been practicing for <clears throat> a very long time, 20 some years. Um, and what I have come to that little, that was a joke by the way, and I'm coming from, uh, I'm coming to you from Nashville actually. So this is not my house. This is the place that I'm renting. And um, it's kind of nice. This is like the only benefit of COVID right now is that we are able to work wherever we are. So um, I just wanted to kind of tell you that that's where I'm at right now. Um, but I have been uh, a dietitian for 20 some years. And through that whole process, what I have come to realize is that it really comes back to food and the closest that we can get from the earth to our plate is what's going to be um, the best options for all of us. So today I will be talking about functional nutrition and functional foods, um, bridging that understanding between food and your well-being. Um, I am a registered dietitian at OS, just so that you, so, so whoever is joining us that does not know. Um, I work at OSU Wexner Medical Center at the Health and Fitness Center in New Albany um, at the Height Center. And you can contact me through the Height Center, through Christine, Christina, through Healthy New Albany, or just um, you can email me directly and then I can respond to any questions. Or if you want to um, get together and talk about how functional foods can help you individually, um, we can also do that. So um, my journey through nutrition has been um, very personal. And I have seen a difference in my life and also um, one of my daughters who has a very severe autoimmune disease, how food has impacted her wellness. And, um, and when I say that, I don't mean just simply what she's consuming, but the way food is medicine. And I think we need to go way, way, way back You'll notice what I have up here is food, let food be thy medicine. This was Hippocrates, uh, Hippocratic Oath or Hipp Hippocrates, I can never say this, um, but the father of medicine in BC 370 um, had come to realize that this is where we start. This is what nourishes our body. This is what starts the foundation to wellness and health. We really don't have to be out looking for something greater and better. Um, and when we think about that, it, it really kind of makes us, or at least for me, it creates a um, feeling of control that we don't have to go out and look beyond ourselves. We can be fundamentally closer to the earth 
And that's where the nutrition really comes from. So um, to understand what functional nutrition and functional food is, we have to go through where we are today and then back step. So I want to talk about health trends and what's impacting our health today. Uh, I want to define what functional foods are versus dysfunctional foods, because I think that's important. I want to talk about the impact of nutrition on our health and wellness. Um, and I want to identify very, very specific foods that we're going to support, support um, our wellness. And I'm going to show you how we can put those foods into everyday practical eating. Um, I also have some recipes on here. I'm not going to go through the recipes, but there's something that you can try um, to really put this into practice. So what's happening today? I think this is where we start, because if we don't know where we're starting from, we have no idea where we're going to go. So the fate of nutrition and the fate of our nation is something that is pretty astounding when you stop and think about it. And I, and I know this is a little bit of a scare tactic, but it's really not because these are facts. 42.4% um, of Americans are obese. That's 40%. That's, that's almost 45%. Almost half of our country is obese. I mean, that's scary especially when you think about our kids. And our kids, 40% of, um, of our children in the United States are obese and almost 20% between the ages of two and 19 are obese. And I'm using a higher number because these numbers are coming from 2019. So if you think about it, we have two years on that and everything that we've been trending has been going up. It's not been going down. So when I say, 20%. I'm estimating that, but that's a pretty accurate number when you think about how we've been trending. Um, and why do I care? Why do I care that obesity is on the rise? Why do I care that our kids are getting heavier and heavier? Well, the complications of obesity are really astounding. We have pulmonary diseases, we have stroke, we have cancer, liver diseases, gallbladder, osteoarthritis, um, things like heart disease, stroke. We know all of them, but we don't really think about it being something as impactful. What I want you to understand is, oh, sorry. Um, according to the National Institute of Health, obesity and being overweight together are the second leading cause of preventable deaths compared to picking up a cigarette and smoking it, okay? So behind tobacco, it's the leading cause. And that's something that we have control over. We have control over our tobacco use, but this is really big. And it's more astounding when you start to think about why, why are we so scared of being overweight? It's not about aesthetics. It's not about if we fit into clothes or not fit into clothes. It really comes down to these disease states. And when we think about the disease states I just talked about, cancer, heart disease, um, stroke, what we really are talking about is inflammation. And I want to everyone to understand who cares, inflammation but it is a bigger deal. Um, a scientist in, uh, in Italy has coined this after many, many years of research, and it's been very popular um, as a terminology for aging, is inflammation is inflam aging. So aging is really referred to inflammation because what ends up happening is that our body is going through a, an inflammatory process that involves everything. And when we have to trigger or fight off any kind of um, infection, injury, toxins, or these ultra processed foods that I'm gonna be talking about, we spike this process to fight off these, um, these in, uh, invaders. But these invaders can happen from the things that we're taking in and ingesting as well as the things that are happening from the outside. And when that happens, this trigger response to our immune system, our body provokes this um, automatic response 
But when our body can't heal itself or it's fighting against itself or it's continually in this um, heightened stage, we never are able to heal. So what ends up happening is that these diseases that we're seeing, um, Alzheimer's, uh, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, um, heart disease, this is an accumulation of inflammation or inflammation, but infla aging. Questions? Holly? Yeah. Um, just a technical question. Do you, are you able to share all of these slides um, or should people take notes throughout if they want but to? They want to take notes, but I can easily send these to you and you can have them. Yep. I, so I can send the slides out in case people, if you don't want to write down all these details. Perfect. And if you want the studies or anything that, because I don't have the studies reference, it was too much, um, but I can get those to you. So everyone that's listening right now. Um, so when we think about why do I care? Why do I care about functional food versus dysfunctional food? Um, it comes to, well, obesity is on the rise. Why? Why, do, why is obesity on the rise? And what do I really care about it? Well, it is uh, the, um, the uh, second, well, behind tobacco use. It is a leading cause of death contributing to something that we all can feel. Um, so coming back to just what is functional nutrition, it's food that can really impact inflammation, healing the gut, balancing out our hormones, protecting our brain, um, protecting our health, or I mean, our heart, as well as um, improving our autoimmune issues. Um, so when you think about food and we focus on food, we want to think about implementing and really establishing the baseline of our intake of food so that it supports, maintains, balances, and optimizes our bodies. Um, and that seems pretty basic. However, when you think about dysfunctional food, dysfunctional food is ultra processed foods. More than 60% of the food that we, can, that we consume in the United States has been ultra processed. So what is that? Things like chips, things like sodas, anything that has been, it's, hold on, it's not advan advancing. Sorry about that. Um, chocolate, candies, ice cream, anything that has been um, brought, basically created in, a, in a, um, an environment that is not nature. Anything that's been created in a laboratory, anything that has had um, additives and preservatives so that it can stay on the shelf longer. So we can think about some of those convenient foods that we eat. You know, somebody had said to me, um, well, I, I'm never going to buy Doritos again, because if I buy a bag of Doritos, that is the serving. So if it's like, you know, this kind of serving or this kind of serving, that becomes a serving. And why is that? Well, these foods have been created and engineered to actually increase the amount we're going to eat. Um, it almost becomes a pathological behavioral response. Once we have one we're not going to stop. And uh, I don't know if any of you have a food like that, that we start to eat and you just can't stop. For me, it's been Twizzlers. I cannot have Twizzlers in my house. I will eat one and then the entire pound bag is gone. Um, so I know what my triggers are and that chemical response when I taste it, it hits. But this has been shown in one of the studies um, that I'm going to reference in just a second that it, it, there is a response to the eating of these highly processed or ultra processed foods. Um, why is that? Well, they disrupt the gut brain connection. Like I said before, it influences our cravings. They've been engineered to do that. It also changes the way that we store the food itself. So when you think about it, our, it comes into our gut and the gut doesn't know how to really process that food. So when it is in the gut and we have this different type of fat or, or a highly um, high or a substantial amount of sugar, what do we do with that? And so our bodies end up storing it differently. I mean, we all know that high fructose, 
high fructose corn syrup and trans fats are things that have been created in the laboratory and have put, been put into our foods. And yes, we have become very aware of that. However, there's a lot more in that category that we just have ignored. So these ultra processed foods have created havoc on our bodies. Um, and when it causes havoc on our bodies, it increases the oxidative stress, cellular damage, and inflammation. So let's go back to what inflammation is. It is our immune system reacting to something that's foreign. And when that happens, we have inflammation that's systemic and our bodies can never catch up to that. So let's talk about what these ultra processed foods are um, creating and what the difference is between ultra processed and more, when I say functional, I mean truly what has come from the earth and came to our table. And that means functional foods. Um, I will be highlighting more functional, but I want you to understand this isn't something that's rocket science. It's about eating and eating strategically. So there was a study in 2019 and this was a small study. Um, it was 40 participants that were taken into a controlled environment. Um, they were uh, held at the National Institute of Health. Um, so 20 of them were given, a, 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 and by the way, um, these were men and women, 20 of them were given a ultra processed eating diet and they could eat as much as they wanted anytime they wanted. The other 20 were given an unprocessed um, diet and they could eat exactly the same as much as they wanted anytime they wanted. Well, what you're seeing here, and then they swapped the groups and it was for two weeks. So what you're seeing here is just the end result. And the end result shows um, in blue was the ultra processed, in red was the unprocessed foods. So as the people were on the unprocessed foods, you'll notice, or natural food, um, you'll notice that their calories stayed about consistent. And remember, they could eat as much as they wanted. Their weight changed, actually, and it started to decrease over these 14 days to the point where they actually lost about 2.2 pounds overall. Um, and let me clarify one more thing. A kilogram of body weight is about 2.2 in pounds. So you can kind of understand that very, that because this is in uh, kilograms. But naturally, they just ate less um, calories. But more importantly, even on the calories that they were eating, they still lost weight. On the ultra processed foods, they ate an average of 500 calories more per day. But here's the thing, they ended up averaging a higher percentage of weight. So they ended up um, not only eating like those 500 calories more, but their body ended up storing it differently and increasing the weight substantially more based on what they were eating. Does that make sense? Am I confusing anyone? Okay, I'm trying to advance this guys, I'm sorry. You know, it's always fun to have, oops, sorry. So what were the end results of this study? They realized that um, the ultra processed foods were disrupting the, what's happening in the gut to the brain. And that means our cravings, our hormonal releases. Um, but they also had seen a increase in their blood um, inflammatory markers. So you can take blood to uh, test what's happening in, in our body that shows an inflammatory markers that are increasing. So they saw a huge increase in that. They saw how our blood sugars were not being controlled even on those 500 calories. It showed that um, the way that people were eating were more pathological. So once they started eating on those highly processed foods, they weren't stopping, even if they um, had deemed themselves full. Um, and like I said, there were some differences in how they stored it. Uh, and for sure, the damage to um, or the inflammation had increased, increased due to um, the food that they were eating. 
So what is, any questions about that again? Nothing? Okay. So what is functional food? To be true, functional food are things that we would eat closest to the ground. You know, I've said that four times and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to probably say that another 10 times because what I'm trying to implement. The International Affairs Institute in Rome. She says vaccine failures threaten your mute that. Thank you. Um, so what I really want to talk about is eating uh, closest to the earth. So some of the things that you can get from food that is closest to the earth are things called phytonutrients or phytochemicals, which I'll be talking about. Um, another word for those are adaptogens. Um, I will also be talking about beta glucans, which I really want to touch on, and it'll probably be about seven minutes of our presentation. I'm going to talk about omega-3 fatty acids, MCT oils, which is more um, about coconut oil, uh, sprouted seeds, resistant starch, and resistant starch really goes into the pre, pro, and postbiotics. Um, right now, you're looking at the screen that shows how uh, all these things that I just said, plus some of the nutrients that we get from the foods that I'm going to be talking about specifically, reinforces our immune system. And once again, I'm going to go back to we're talking about inflammation because inflammation is really the cornerstone that leads into all the disease states. I'm trying to advance just a second. Sorry about that. Okay, I'm gonna be talking about specifically salmon, avocado, coconut oil. When we talk about beta glucans, I'm going to be talking about mushrooms of all things. And I know it's been something that's a little more popularized right now. Um, micro greens or sprouted greens. I'm not going to be talking about berries specifically, but these foods that I've listed out are the foods that I think we should be able to get in in a whole week in one way or another. And I'll hopefully be able to show you that at the end. Um, green tea or matcha, uh, turmeric or curcumin, chia seeds, and sweet potatoes. Once again, I'm just simply trying to advance here. So let's talk about omega-3 fatty acids. Do you guys know, have you heard of omega-3s? Yes, no, thumbs up. Yeah. Okay, all right, good. Thumbs up, that's what I need to see. All right, so we've had a lot of talk about it, but what does it do for us? Not what our neighbor says it does, or just because someone else takes it, but really what does it do? Well, omega-3 fatty acids, are something that can be used clinically. And when I say clinically, I mean, it can be a prescription that we're gaining, getting from the doctor to help benefit not only our brain health, but our heart health. Um, what it does specifically is it reduces our inflammation throughout the body. So much so that it can be a prescription to help with our heart. Um, many people have been prescribed this as a therapy. What I wanna recommend for everyone though, before you just run out and get a supplement or do anything at all, you always wanna to talk to your doctor. And I'm gonna make this caveat and I'm gonna make it very clear because some of these vitamins and minerals and fatty acids, specifically omega-3s, thin the blood so much that if you are on like a blood thinner, this could be counterintuitive to what you're doing, but that's how powerful what we eat and what we consume can be. Um, so omega-3s in the right ratio, because it's not just omega-3s, but it's a ratio of what we're doing can even improve our um, brain and our immune response, uh, joint health, et cetera. So what does it do? I'm just trying to advance, guys. Okay. Specifically, when you think about food, 
Salmon is one of those foods that has a very high proportion of omega-3s. Uh, chia seeds also has a, have a high proportion of, of omega-3s. However, a lot of the research that's been done has been done on fish oil specifically. So some of the omega-3 um, fish oils that you can get over the counter are amazing. Um, you want to think about, am I supplementing through food or am I supplementing through a supplement that I can get over the counter? I always recommend food first. So what is recommended right now is about three servings of fish a week. And that can be um, canned salmon, fresh salmon. You can also get it in tuna fish um, and some of the other fishes. But what is the real goal here? The goal is to achieve a ratio that is one to four. So that means one um, for every gram of omega-3s, you want four grams of a different type of fat. Well, the problem in America is that we are in this ultra processed eating. We have, like I said, 60% or more of our food source or food supply or the foods that we're providing for our children is processed. When it's processed, we're using canola, corn, safflower oils to um, create this product called food. Well, when we do that, it changes the ratio of our intake of omega-3s to omega-6s. And you don't really need to understand that as much as understanding that this ratio of our fats is so substantially off that it becomes um, almost detrimental. So what we have to do is to decrease that ultra processed foods and then increase more of a natural eating um, profile. Eating fish three times a week is a great option. Increasing with our chia seeds, and it doesn't mean that you're dousing yourself with it, but it means adding like two tablespoons in on the days that you're actually not taking in the fish. Um, another option though is to get, once you talk to your doctor, is to take a supplement that's over the counter, and that's about one gram of omega-3s per day. Um, of fish oils. Questions about that? This can substantially reduce your inflammatory markers and increase and decrease inflammation altogether. Molly, I do have a question about the fish yeah. oil. Yes. I take at my doctor's recommendation 10, 12 years ago, fish oil. He had me on three or four of them a day. And then when I got the next OSU complimentary medicine doc, she put me on triple fish oil twice a day. She tried for three times a day, but my gut wasn't having it. So I have no idea how many grams I'm getting. You know what, um, Elaine, I would be happy to help you. So if you stop by Healthy New Albany, um, or if you want to email me, I would love a picture of what you're taking, and then I can answer that question. Okay. That's good. Thank you. Is that good? Yeah. Oh, that's I fine. Think that's super that's important. Good. Yeah. And all I'll do is give you the information. Um, I don't know your health risks or your health concerns with your physicians, but that is very easy for me to identify for you. Uh, they, they all look at what I'm taking and nobody ever says anything. I think a ref, uh, yeah, I think a, a referral to a dietitian would be beneficial. Okay. Uh, Thank you. You can do this. Holly, is this a, a time to ask about the coconut oil? Not yet. Or, I'm going to get there in just one second. Okay, I'm gonna, I'll hold my, I'll yeah. hold my question. Okay, perfect. If um, just, just we're going to go through mushrooms and then we're going to get on to coconut oil. Good. Yeah, Molly. While you're talking about omega threes, we had a question in the chat. Just are is flax oil a good supplement for omega threes? Um, flax oil, it's okay. Honestly, the research has been done on specifically fish oil. So the omega-3, the, um, the profile, if I, if I took something and I wanted to look at, is this going to be good for me? It shows that um, the fish itself, there's the, the, the oil that's coming from that is so much better for us than just flax and 
even chia seeds. However, it's still a good source, but it has also those omega, those other types of fats. So there's a combination there. And if you're already having a high proportion of the other kinds of fats, you're going to skew that ratio. So let me explain something. Um, if I only, if I was playing musical chairs and there were six people, but only uh, three chairs, you know that there's only gonna be three people sitting, right? And the other people are gonna be out of the game. Well, essentially, um, omega-3s and omega-6s kind of play that game. And if there's 25 of these omega-6s and only one of the good stuff, what's the, what's the likelihood that these guys aren't going to get a seat, right? So essentially what I'm trying to tell you is that we want more omega-3s versus those omega-6s because they're not going to get the seat, there's only so many places where um, they can be absorbed. So if we're gonna get our omega-3s in, the best way of getting them in, it, it truly is going to be from fish. Does that help you or does that confuse you? Think about musical chairs, think about who's gonna get a chair. Well, if you're gonna bombard that um, game with the other types of fish, they're not, or I mean, the other types of um, fat, it's, they're not going to get a chair, the fish aren't. Does that make sense? Kind of? Yes? No? Maybe so? No. You guys are like, what the heck is she talking about? Okay, good. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to talk about mushrooms now. Have you guys heard about the, the push for mushrooms? Yes? No? Maybe so. Okay. Well, what's interesting about mushrooms is that this isn't something revolutionary. We have been using mushrooms since the dawn of time. If you think about um, Native Americans and if you think about um, some of our other cultural um, beliefs, mushrooms have been used in teas and herbs, medicinal ways forever. We just now know what's actually happening within the mushroom that makes it even more powerful. There's something called beta-glucans in mushrooms. Well, beta-glucans are really just a carbohydrate. What we've uh, analyzed and have come to realize is that the beta-glucans that are coming in the form of from mushrooms, so you get beta-glucans from oatmeal as well, but what's coming from the mushroom is so powerful because as you see on my screen here, you'll notice that this is the fungus right here. This is your mushroom. And down here, you'll see some different types of beta-glucans. Here's the powerhouse, these ergosterols, okay? And what those do is they actually get our immune system kind of revved up to respond to microbial infections. So right now they're studying these beta-glucans, uh, the, the power they have against the COVID uh, from that uh, virus. They have seen an increase um, or a protective effect when they take these beta-glucans in combination with a few other things to actually prevent or um, retard or decrease what this virus can do in our body. But prior to even the COVID situation in this um, and where we're at, they've been using beta-glucans intravenously to decrease uh, tumor growth as well as, and here's a big one, to prevent tumor proliferation. So basically the growth of other tumors throughout our bodies. And that really is powerful. That's coming from food. That's not something that we have to get a prescription for. That's food. And we can make an impact in what we're doing in our bodies just from that. Um, something that I think some of you may have known is that I've been dousing myself with because I was going to get the vaccine, um, which I did this past week, just to really rev up my immune system, both with these the mushrooms, um, with green stuff as I'm drinking right now, which also has mushroom um, in it. But to be able to really 
uh, boost my immune system to take on what was going to happen. And this is all through food. It's not through a, a prescription. So the mushroom in itself has been studied and what we realize is the benefits from it. This recipe right here that I have, um, I want to share this with you only because I want to, I'm a real big um, saver on um, on how we're spending our money. But Costco right now has a pound of three different varieties of mushrooms, um, both the shiitake, the enoki, and the cremini, I, I believe that's the other one, uh, that it's, it's $9.99 and it's a, a pound of these organic mushrooms. And this is what I'm talking about, a very simple, simple recipe that you can put into play today. Something that's not gonna cost you a fortune, something that tastes delicious. Um, so if you wanna get that recipe, I know Christina can get that for you. To whoever had asked about, yeah? Yeah, no, Molly, I just, there were a couple of questions about mushrooms I wanted okay. you to look at yeah. before. Um, so, uh, yeah, like are there certain types of mushrooms that are better than others and, or that have the most benefits and then is, is cooking them, does that take away any of the benefit? Those are great questions. Um, the first question about the, uh, specific mushrooms, the really big thing is to get a variety. Um, so right now I'm, I'm actually, um, I have. Okay, I'll just give you the ones. Um, lion's mane seems to be pretty powerful. Um, that's not true hair from a lion, but that's a mushroom. Uh, reishi is another one. Um, there's uh, ones that we're gonna eat that aren't necessarily that you'd put over water and use and steep. Um, those are the ones that were very beneficial that you can get more commercially. The idea is in every mushroom though, you're gonna have these beta glucans. And the more that you uh, take in, the more of these ergosterols or this improvement to your immune system, you're gonna have. Does, I hope that answers it. So there's a variety and, and what you can do is look through, or I mean, look at your products, eating them, drinking them, having them in your coffee, which is what um, that I do now. Um, it's any way that you can get them in and cooking them. Does that cause a, or does it benefit or, or does it hurt it? No, it does nothing. There's been nothing that has shown that it does. Now I'm saying that today, there could be a study that comes out tomorrow that shows it does something better, worse, whatever. But for today, there's been nothing about that that has um, increased or decreased. What other questions on mushrooms? Okay. If Good. you ever, if you're ever on the sawmill area, if you want to see an incredible variety of mushrooms, there is a small Asian market and easily has half a dozen to a dozen different mushrooms. Yes. Um, that's a great, what I want to make sure though, um, because it's a fungus, please make sure you understand what you're eating. If somebody had um, an autoimmune disease or something that had their already compromised, I just want to make sure everyone understands that they're they want to make sure that the mushrooms are healthy for them, okay? Because there's some mushrooms that will have an effect that maybe not be what you want them to be. Absolutely. Okay, is that fair to say? So um, I actually had emailed Dr. Hyman um, from the Cleveland Clinic and had gotten a reference um, to a place that was reputable. I can give you guys that, um, but that's where I get my coffee um, mushroom. Um, I get the elixir. I get a few other things that has been, for me, I feel more comfortable with it. And then I also try to know what I'm eating. So I'm going to move on though, because I really want to talk about coconut oil and MCT oil, because this is pretty amazing stuff. What you're looking at is kind of scientific. What I want to show you is I know there's a big push to use coconut oil. Nobody knows why. 
I have asked people, so why are you using coconut oil? I don't know, because it's supposed to be good for you. That's not an answer. I think we have to be empowered to understand why we're doing things. That just drives me crazy. So coconut oil in itself is good for you in the sense that it offers benefits. Now it is a saturated fat. So some people are like, wait a minute, but that saturated fat, I thought that was bad for us. That in itself is a whole controversy I'm not going to get to. What I want to talk about is why are we eating coconut oil in itself? Coconut oil has something, and I, I'm going to try to get as simple as possible. It has something in it, or the way the fats are, are called medium chain triglycerides or medium chains. So we have long chains, we have short chains, and then we have these medium chains. Well, these medium chains are extremely powerful. So powerful that they have been used to, um, as a therapy for Alzheimer's for any kind of neurodegenerative diseases, okay? So much so that I have a study that's written up here just so that you can get a, a feel for it. Um, because what ends up happening in the, in the brain is when you're giving your body more medium chains, um, there's a conversion factor and your body uses this medium chain fat um, and it changes it into something called ketones. When it's changed into ketones, that's where the benefit happens, okay? So what I want you to understand is keeping this simple, why you want coconut oil versus um, maybe using canola oil and specifically canola oil um, is because what it's giving you are the different type of fat and that different type of fat changes in our body that can create um, ketones. Those ketones have an effect on what's happening in our, in our brain. So in this study that was done, it was a randomized study, patients that were institutionalized. And now this is a very small study, but you can go through and get on, um, on the PubMed or NIH and uh, research this yourself. It's very, very simple. But what they had put the patients on was a, um, a, uh, a Mediterranean diet and then added in coconut oil, either that or no coconut oil. The people that were receiving the coconut oil, the addition of the coconut oil, had an improved episodic memory, temporal, and somatic um, improvements. The people that were not given the coconut oil did not have those changes. So just so you understand what that means is that um, somatic, memory is uh, thinking about like remembering what color, like when you see color, you know that that color is red or that a dog is a dog. Um, it's just simple stuff that we just kind of know. So when you think about your memory and how it's um, being improved or how it's being supported, you want to think about, am I doing everything that I can? Well, when you decrease inflammation in the brain, when you decrease overall systemic inflammation, you're improving the way our brain can function. In addition to that, when you're adding in things like a little bit of coconut oil, changing out that canola oil um, to, to uh, a coconut oil that can actually make improvements. Why? Because I've already said the canola oil is something that's been, it's a really highly processed oil. And in addition to that, it's in so much of our food that it gives this ratio that's not gonna be beneficial. And it, it increases the inflammation. Now to decrease that inflammation, olive oil is a great substitute. Things like um, coconut oil that actually is going to change our fat profile is a great change from these canola and uh, corn and vegetable oils that are highly processed. So I, you, I, go ahead. I was the one who asked about the coconut oil. 
Oh, okay. Gail, go ahead and ask the question. And I said, yeah. And I, one of the areas, and I have been following Cleveland Clinic on this yes. because I have genetic high cholesterol mm -hmm. and it's the di the research has been going on for at least five years that I've been following it. Oh, it's Would long. you, pardon me? It's longer than that. Go ahead though. I keep talking. I was going to say for me, it was only five years. Um, and I'm sure it's more. Would you encourage your patients who have high cholesterol to use the coconut oil or go to uh, either avocado or olive oil? Okay. And if you don't want to address it, because I wasn't sure, because you were blaking up at the time that you didn't want to get into specifics. And I thought, okay, I'll try to find, you know why you're uh, breaking up. Oh, you, I'm breaking up on your phone. Probably. Is everyone hearing me? Okay. Yeah. Elaine, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, I can, I can hear, hear you. Yeah. I'll stop walking. Yeah. Maybe. And then you can hear me. Um, just for a second. I'll, I'll talk to you about that. I'll address that. So, um, I understand saturated fats and, um, I would love to talk to you specifically, Gail, about the, I'm holding my tongue because there's some things about saturated fats that we really, I think the, we, we don't understand. Um, saturated fats, even though they're saturated, that doesn't mean they're bad for us. Um, I want you to imagine right now, and I'm gonna just talk about this for a second because I think this is important for you to understand. If I had three caterpillars, okay? And I use this example because I think we can all imagine this. And my caterpillars were all, um, they, they had eight legs and they had 10 legs. And then the last one had 12 legs. And all those legs had shoes, those feet of those legs had shoes on them, okay? So all of them had shoes. Would you say all of them have shoes and that would be saturated, right? They're all saturated with shoes. Nobody is missing a shoe, correct? So that's saturated fat, okay? They're all, they all have shoes, okay? Now, each caterpillar, I, I talked about three different caterpillars, right? They all have different heads on them. One has a smiley face with big blue eyes. One has... Um, a frown with brown eyes. One is like, you know, mediocre. And he's just like kind of sitting there like whatever. Well, that head matters. That head matters so much that it depends on what that head is that will determine if that quote saturated fat, that caterpillar is good or bad. So the smiley guy that has um, maybe eight legs that has all of his shoes are on, right? So all of his legs are saturated with shoes. All of them have a shoe. He has a really big smiley face and he has big blue eyes and he's like raring to go. Well, guess what? That caterpillar with eight legs is treated completely different in the body than the other caterpillars that I talked about. So much so that using that that caterpillar that has eight legs, it, it revs up our um, metabolism. It doesn't even go into the liver to digest. That's what I'm talking about. This is so intricate that I don't even wanna to touch on it because that caterpillar, even though it's saturated fat, quote, saturated fat, it's treated completely different than other saturated fats, all because of its head, all because of it's an acid, all because of its head being different, is a different way that it's treated. So you having high, uh, you said you had heart disease, right, Gail? High cholesterol. I think you said, high, I can't hear you, but I'm gonna assume it's high cholesterol. It's gonna be treated completely different than other um, saturated fats. So one thing is not created equally. And it's that intricate that can be very, very powerful in your diet. So when I say, should I take out uh, avocado oil or um, 
or avoc avocado, you said avocado or um, olive, oil. olive oil, olive oil, and substitute in uh, coconut oil. What I would recommend, and I don't know your history, so I'm not going to give you medical right. advice, but what I'm going to ask you to do is to do a variety because that's the power in it. I'm not telling you to go out and eat red meat because that's going to have a different head on it, right? It, it does. Yeah, I wouldn't. <laughs> well, I, what my point yeah. is, is that it's a different head. So if you think about those caterpillars and you think about how different each caterpillar looks, it's the same thing. Each caterpillar or each saturated fat is not treated the same in the body. Got so you. I would ask you to please get a variety in. So maybe if you're going to be using a tablespoon of coconut oil because you're sauteing um, and making up an Asian dish, use that. If you're creating or sauteing onions for uh, an Italian dish, maybe you use the olive oil. Maybe you use the um, avocado oil because you need to get something really, really crispy and it has a very high smoke. Right. So then you change it and you're going to use the olive or the avocado oil because we don't want to denature or change our fat when we burn it because that creates something bad. So what I'm asking you to do is to get a variety. I'm not asking you to change out. What I am asking you to do is do not use vegetable oils. Can I ask you that? Don't do that. I don't use it. It's only the, the other ones, but I, I have stayed away. You're asking moderation and variation. And I have varied, be, varied between two, but I have been very hesitant to add any coconut. And, and so, the fact that Cleveland Clinic has been doing research on this and until COVID, when they finally came out with a recommendation um, and they weren't really wholeheartedly recommending anything. So I just wanted your personal and I, th I knew you were hesitant, but that makes sense what you're talking about, the variation, the mod just being um, moderate in usage. I think it's really important we consider, um, I think Americans, we, we like to do this bandwagon. And once we're on it, we're like cruising away, eating a ton of it, and then we abuse it. So I, I, I believe that we have to think about temperance and moderation, that just exactly what you said, but the, the variety and not taking anything to an extreme. Um, although we like to, and then we pay the 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 price. Um, price. Anything in too much is too much. So well, um, thank you. I hope I answered your question and I hope you, you did because it's really important. You understand that this comes down to how things are done in the body and what it's showing is just astounding research um, and astounding things that can happen. And I mean this, the difference between those heads on a caterpillar changes the way that our body uses that fat um and and that's pretty dang powerful to increase our metabolism oh my gosh i'm so sorry that sorry my phone was sitting right next to me so i think um we have to think about you know moderation and temperance let me quickly go through one more thing um because i'm looking at the time and i want to have you guys ask more questions but i want to address i know we've talked about pre pro and po and um that pre and probiotics, but what we haven't talked about is postbiotic. And I don't want you guys to leave here without understanding what that is. It's a really silly, fancy um, terminology just for what's happening after our bacteria works on the food we're giving it. So what comes before is the food. What's in our gut, so are we feed these probiotics or the stuff that's in our gut, and that's pro. And that's what we get from yogurt and what we get from kimchi. And then what, what ends up happening as this food that we're eating or the food that the bacteria is working on creates something called post or these um, things called short chain fatty acids. We don't need to know that as much as we need to understand how powerful this is. Um, the stuff that's created after our gut works on it. 
supports the immune system, but so much so that it releases products in our bloodstream, products in our gut that's absorbed in our bloodstream to really reduce inflammation in a pretty substantial um, way. It, it improves our, um, our skin, it improves our allergies. It is unbelievable what these short chain fatty acids or the stuff that's created this postbiotic um, can do for our health so much so that it actually um, improves our mood. It improves our ability to digest, store, metabolize our foods. It, it alters what gene expressions that are happening in cells. It's crazy strong stuff. Um, and that postbiotic um, the one that we really, really want is called butyrate. Butyrate is something that's created, but unfortunately, being the po most powerful one, we don't produce as much of it. It's the least amount that we're able to produce, but it's the most beneficial. Why is that? I don't know why, but it is what it is. And so what we're trying to do and what I want to talk about right now is how do I get more of this this postbiotic or this butyrate in my body or for our, for our gut to work on, we need what's gonna, what we're feeding it. And that's the prebiotic. So what do I get in, what do I, what can I do to, to make more of this stuff? What can I feed my gut bacteria? Well, it's as simple as oatmeal. And when I say simple as oatmeal, what I mean is, has everyone heard of cold oats? And I have a recipe that's gonna come next right here, but feeding or eating cold oats, or um, we, we call them overnight oats, you get eight grams of resistant starch per cup compared to a cup of regular cooked oats, which is four grams, um, just simply by putting it in the refrigerator overnight, allowing it to be, uh, creating a puffier um, oat and then eating it that way. That's gonna give you these, these prebiotics that your gut bacteria is gonna work on. That's gonna create this thing called butyrate or postbiotic that's gonna give you what we need to have all those healthy benefits that I just talked about. What are some other ways? Well, I don't know if anyone eats rice anymore, but I hope we do. But even cooking up rice and this means thinking ahead. Instead of only making a cup of rice, maybe you make two cups of rice. You put it in the refrigerator overnight for at least 24 hours. 36 hours seems to be about what it should be. You take it out, you put some water in it, you heat it in the microwave, and all of a sudden you've increased the resistant starch of that rice, which means you're feeding your gut bacteria, you're creating something that's really positive, and you're creating this butyrate. Um, it, it ends up that for every 100 calories of rice that you've put in the refrigerator overnight, um, so 100 calories, about 70 of those calories are actually converted into energy, whereas that 30 calories from that, that 100 is worked on by your bacteria, creating this butyrate which is pretty substantial. Even cooking up potatoes and putting them in the refrigerator. And then maybe the next day you take some of your, um, those potatoes and you cut them up and you or dice them up and you can make like a, a hash or um, something for breakfast or you put an egg in it or um, Gail I, or Elaine, I think you said you were having eggs uh, for, e for the evening. You could have easily have cut up a half a cup, a half a, um, potato that you had already cooked the night before and put it in there. And that is a way of getting in this postbiotic or creating, it's really prebiotic, but getting the benefit of what we want to do, which is this postbiotic. I'm going to fast forward this because I think we are done, but I wanted to show you how easy this can be. So what I want to impress upon is to eliminate ultra processed foods, these convenient foods, and get more into how we can put functional foods or real food into our eating plan. And it's not hard. It means we have to think about it. And for heaven's sake, we have to think. Heavens, 
or we have to think about calling the doctor to make an appointment because we're sick. So it's about pre-thinking. It's about, okay, my foresight is I want to have rice. Well, instead of one cup, I'm going to do two cups. Or heck, I'm going to put in my refrigerator tonight overnight oats. I'm going to have some green tea tomorrow. Both of those are functional foods. Now, mid-morning snack, what am I going to do? Huh, Molly said that turmeric can be anti-inflammatory. And I know that um, inflammation is really the hallmark of our disease states. So what am I going to do? I'm going to have turmeric tea. Huh, with what? Maybe a little bit of coconut milk. There is another one. Next, maybe for lunch, instead of just simply grabbing something and going, maybe I'm going to have some Greek yogurt and I'm going to add some chia seed to it, or maybe I'm going to have some avocado on top of my salad. This is pre, this is forethought. It's not rocket science. Hold on. I'm trying to advance this. I don't know why it's not advancing. Hold Oh, there it goes. Um, maybe for an afternoon snack, instead of grabbing um, chips or something that's just sitting around because it's a pretty package or, you know, goldfish because they're sitting there because that's what my kids were eating. Maybe I have some forethought and I make chia pudding, which is also on this slide production um, where it is literally chia seeds with any kind of uh, milk that you want sat in the refrigerator forethought here. You can add coconuts, you can add raspberries. Remember I mentioned about berries being a amazing um, functional food. And then maybe I'm going to sprinkle on some walnuts, which is a, one of those healthier fats. Dinner, huh, there I am again. I'm going to have sauteed mushrooms with some salmon. Maybe I'm going to reheat my rice that I had made the day before. What is that again? Postbiotic. Um, maybe I'm going to have some, throw some microgreens on my salad. That also is a, one of those foods that add a richness to our, um, to eating that's going to create a beneficial effect. And now maybe my evening snack is going to be for sure turmeric tea, and then maybe something else. But I tried to lay this out that this is not rocket science, it's forethought. It's getting rid of all of the processed or ultra processed foods that cause damage, rather than bringing in some of the foods that we know that actually have an effect on our body. And it's so much more, so much of an effect that it can create a healing, um, a healing property. It does create that. And it creates a wellness that comes from not only the gut, but traveling to our brain, to our um, systemically, to our joints, to um, the way that we are living in general. So I, I want to really push that functional foods. It's coming from the basic um, premise that what it comes from the ground to our plate is the best way. Questions about anything we talked about? I know I'm over time. I'm so sorry. Can you share the slides with the recipes uh, with the people here so we can go ahead and make those things? Absolutely. And Mike, I really want you to go out and get those mushrooms from um, from Costco. Uh, yeah, I will. I was planning. I, I was telling uh, Karen that I made these mushrooms up and thank goodness no one in my house likes mushrooms because I ate the whole entire pound of mushrooms myself. But once you cook them down, it doesn't seem, it's not that much, but um, unbelievable recipe. I just gobbled it down. It was so delicious. Um, but questions about some other things that I had talked about. I know I had so much information. I would love to delve into just facts because I think to understand all this terminology is very, very difficult. Uh, what I want you to understand is that I honor your knowledge and I honor that I don't wanna tell you that it's just healthy for you because I think that's almost disrespectful. I think we need to understand why we're doing things and I think it's about knowledge. It doesn't mean that you have to recite exactly what I'm saying, but what it is is that you have an understanding of that's right, caterpillars, smiley face. Yes, I remember that. And I remember that 
I'm supposed to be making sure I get a variety in and not just because my neighbor does it, not because my doctor says so, it's because I understand. And I understand maybe on a simplistic basis, but I understand why. And if you can't get that, I think it's disrespectful to say it's just healthy for you. And I've had a lot of people I've asked before, why do you eat blueberries? And they're like, I don't know, something about like antioxidants, but they don't understand why. Well, once you understand the why and you understand that it's like putting up a force field against all the toxins that are happening in our body, that it's like a warrior that can like protect us then it resonates into our brain and we can hold on to that and go, oh, it's a resonant, it, it kind of makes us feel like we're powerful. Then all of a sudden blueberries have a meaning to us. Um, so that's where I really want to empower everyone to be. Hey Molly? Yes. Are you taking clients down at the New Albany Center? I am, I am. Thank you. So if, um, Christina, would you mind um, being able to provide my email? Yeah, just your OSU email. You can do OSU. You can do um, Hotmail. Honestly, I'd rather if it's I'd rather just do the OSU email because um, my personal email, although I use it, it is personal, and I get a five thousand email. I'm exaggerating, but I get a lot of emails that I have to weed through to get to important ones. Um, so yeah, my OSU email would be best. I'm happy to share that though. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I do want to tell you guys, I, I try to look at, um, health risks as well as health conditions and then help you to understand how food can play a role in what you're eating. I mean, I'm sorry, a role in your health, um, health risks. It's, it's not a generalized, um, plan. It's about, who you are and uh, really taking what is going to be most impactful for you versus um, this generalized eating. I've functional eating is and functional nutrition is about you individually. If you have an issue with dairy, I wouldn't ask you to ever eat dairy. I don't think that everyone should be off dairy either. Um, I think it depends on a lot of things like where you come from, meaning um, masters in public health. I understand uh, that different um, ethnicities handle things a little bit differently. If you come from a different um, place in the world, you actually may be better off eating dairy and it's actually extremely beneficial for you because your body is equipped to digest it. Whereas somebody else isn't going to be, it doesn't mean it's bad or good. It just means it's you individually. And that's where um, a lot of this needs to come into play is that we can't generalize things. We can't say all saturated fats are bad because that's not true. We already know that, um, but we also know that not one food is bad or good either. So it, it takes an ability to understand how this represent, how this can play a, an important factor in your individual health. Questions? No, I love you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming to Nashville with me. Yeehaw. I think I'm going to put my cowboy boots on and go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I really, I, I hope that these recipes are um, as good as I think they are, but um, if not, please contact me with any other questions. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.